that you've joined us to celebrate our 40th anniversary of Penny Hydraulics. Um, but of course it's not the first time that you've been here, is it? No, I came here 26 years ago when you'd only been going for 14 years to open. I mean, the, it was, you had been here for some time in Clown, but 14 years was a significant point. And your grandfather and father were both happily here on that occasion. But I didn't think then I might be asked back 26 <laughs> years later. Well, but yes. what's been accomplished is very, very exciting. And I think, I wonder whether your grandfather would realise, you know, would conceivably have imagined that it would have grown not only in amount, you know, revenue, mm -hmm. margin, profit, but the array of products that you have, including now the MES lifts, nuclear, yeah. which is a long way away from where he started, mm -hmm. except, except for one thing, that the, the founders of the business, your father and your grandfather, were both very um, entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurial, not just, in, not, not just or not mainly in the financial sense, but they liked challenge of things that were difficult. Yes. And someone said to me today that your father, if told something couldn't be done, liked that because he was <laughs> yes. going to do it. Precisely. And there's a lot here. But it, and the thing that strikes me most in, in some remarks I made earlier, I said that you know, Chesterfield, the greater area of which Clown is a part, isn't going to have big manufacturing again. And I don't think it will. No, the country won't have much big manufacturing again. But what's interesting about firms like this is nimbleness and the ability uh, to design a product in a quite different way. It's not making a pit prop, which yeah. is standard, which your grandfather was servicing or maintaining in his early working life, but actually designing a quite different product to meet the needs of a particular customer. And, and, and I think we're moving into a new phase in business and in the world economy, probably, where things are not just mass-produced, but things are customer-centric. And the more customer-centric things become, the greater the competitive edge of firms like Penny Hydraulics. Family-owned, you can take time, you don't have to do it before the next quarter earnings announcement. You're not looking for return on capital this year. You can be patient. Mm -hmm. Because you want to be here in 25 years' time. That's it. And you, you hear the word nowadays in manufacturing, agility quite a lot, agility mm. and flexibility. And I certainly think that that's something that's been a, um, a key component to our, our success to date. And just going sort of talking about manufacturing in general, um, you often hear now, sadly, people saying that manufacturing in the UK is dead and that we don't make here, uh, make things in this country anymore. What, what would be your response to that? Well, I, the first response is a rather pedestrian one. You have to be very, very clear indeed what it is you're talking about, mm. what we're talking about. What is manufacturing? Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of what's done here is not manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may be the biggest value added of Penny Hydraulics is not manufacturing. Sure. But is the CAD CAM stuff, is the design stuff saying this is what uh, uh, Magnox or British Nuclear Fuels would have need for a particular application, mm -hmm. not the manufacturing itself mm -hmm. important mm -hmm. as that is. So the first point is what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. And if you if you define manufacturing more widely like that to include all the design, yep. manufacturing is not on its back yes. in this yep. country. The second probably equally important point I'd make is that I think uh, uh, manufacturing in many ways is on the way out. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this design stuff, being able to cope in all sorts of areas, not just this, with masses of data, masses of data, mm -hmm. and find relationships in data that then enable you to come up with a medical solution, something which so something which is going to help diagnosis uh, of medical conditions sure. is really powerful. Yeah. And that's a way of improving the quality of human life 
which is, has nothing at all to do with having a new ironing board, a new fridge or a new motor car. Mm -hmm. And so things like motor cars, which are increasingly manufactured without human intervention, there's been very clever tuning. Someone says, I want a hybrid, and it's three litres, and da da da, press a button, the car comes through the production line and won't be driven off by a human. It'll be. Now, that's the way in which the world is going. And I think the question that becomes more interesting than how much manufacturing we have is is what we're doing improving the quality of people's lives? Yeah. If it is, then this country is in a very good position mm. because we're rather good at this sort of thing. Uh, what we're not good enough at is commercial exploitation. We have the ideas and we don't. And I think penny hydraulics is a very good model in a microcosm of how to have the ideas, think how they can be applied and then market them. Yeah. Thinking a bit um, back to our roots and my grandfather and my father and my uncles that currently run the business with our uh, board of directors. We're still a proudly family run business, as you know. Um, I just wondered, can you tell us a little bit about your connection to the Penny family, where that all started? Um, and then we could talk a little bit about family business and, and your experiences working with family businesses to date. Well, the, 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 uh, the connection to the family business started with your grandmother. She's a little bit older than me. Um, but we knew each other when we were very young and we shared aunts and uncles who were not real relatives but lived very close together mm -hmm. and grew up as very close friends. Um, I knew your great-grandfather um, and I think in Eckington, where everybody was then, uh, there was a very close association among um, enterprising families and there yes. weren't a lot. My maternal grandfather was extremely enterprising. Mm -hmm. uh, your uh, family, the Wasney family, mm -hmm. as well as the Penny family, were extremely enterprising. And I think people with similar interests just in a small community come together. And this is what can happen, I think, in a family business. Yes. And bring in people who are respectful of the ability, uh, I, I can't emphasize enough what a problem uh, there is in big, two, two problems in big business. One you've mentioned, it's very hard for a big business to be agile. Yes. Oh, uh, you know, it's not in this division or it's not in that division. And getting divisions to collaborate. So you have the design people, the manufacturing people, the welding people, the marketing people. I think in Penny Hydraulics you can all sit around the table and fix it. Yes. Uh, very hard. Um, in a divisional structure in a big company. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other, the other problem of a big company, which is listed on a stock exchange, is the pressure to perform in the short term. Yes. And the focus is very much on earnings this quarter. Now, that I think is diminishing. Some people like me are campaigning to reduce it. Mm -hmm. but it's a long, slow slog. And this is one of the reasons why family business in some countries in Europe, above all Germany, continues to be so significant. Yes. And the Germans are a great model. They have lots of companies like Penny Hydraulics, some much bigger, some about the same size. And I don't think the Germans will likely abandon the family in the ship form because it has all these advantages. Nimble. It's a nice working atmosphere. Mm -hmm. If your family, I mean of course families can be together and not get on, but if families can be together and get on, huge premium in terms of the value additive contribution those relationships can make Absolutely. because everyone's trusted yes yeah i agree 100 percent um so we've ridden through some challenging times it's not always been straightforward for the business um most notably uh, coming through the recession um now we don't really know what's going to happen in the future um we've got brexit to consider 10 percent of our business revenue is from exports um, outside the uh, UK to other countries within the, within the European Union. Um, so we may have challenging times ahead. We're going to close on this question. What tips would you give to the future leaders of this business? Um, well, I, before I answer that specific question, I'd say that for a business like this, 
uh, uh, there are plenty of things to worry about. Not worrying, but worry is only useful if it's, con it's constructive, so worry constructively. I wouldn't worry about Brexit, mm -hmm. whatever you and I might think about all that and how appallingly incompetently it's, the negotiations appear to be going on both sides. I think for a business that is nimble, agile, smart, can adapt quickly, uh, whatever the Brexit outcome ain't going to make a lot of difference. So I wouldn't, that's a thing not to worry about. Mm -hmm. I, I think there are some things that I would identify as things that you just cleave to as long-term sort of values. This is how Penny Hydraulics does things. I mean, uh, the most critical, uh, which you can't pull a lever and deliver it, the most critical thing in any business like this is being really attentive to the way you deal with one another within the business. Mm -hmm. That's more important than the way you deal with customers. Because if you don't have relationships of trust within the business, you're never going to look after customers properly. So recognise the importance of trust within the businesses, and that's a permanent, everlasting quality. If you lose it, it's very, very damaging. Much easier to lose than to re reconstitute or to, or, or to rebuild. The second thing I'd emphasize, other things, second thing I'd emphasize is to, to be as attentive as you currently are. I think I do more at it, actually, as you customize product for a really very special requirement the nuclear industry or meslifts or whatever it is. I do think you're going to need more apprenticed types who are bright young people. They may or may not have a university degree. Frankly for me that doesn't matter very much. Mm -hmm. I mean the deficit, the deficiency in this country is of apprentices who've had the opportunity to have two days a week at Chesterfield Tech or the University of Derby or Hallam or whatever it is and three or four days a week on the shop floor being mentored by the very experienced team you've got here. And I think if you can have people like that, nurture them, you lose some to other employers, but if they go and they're good leavers in a good atmosphere, a good spirit, they'll either want to come back or will ensure that business comes to us or we can use them. You've you made know, that connection. You know, you've, you've made a connection. So I sometimes think it's very, I, I've lost lots of people. At the end of the day, if they're good people, it's a compliment yeah. because other people want to poach good people. But your job is to make sure you have an abundance of good people and then have depth on the bench so that if someone who's critical goes, you've got someone who's ready to take over. That's very sound advice. That's that management. Is. That's very sound advice. Thank you very much once again for your time, David. We're so, uh, so honoured to have you here. Very happy to be here.